Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And most of all, thank you to Ken Binmore for accepting this invitation. It is a pleasure for, uh, for us to have Ken Binmore with us. And I have the strange um, uh, task of introducing Ken Binmore in a community of game theorists. <laughs> so, I mean, what, what should I say? Uh, put, put yourself in my, in my shoes. So, Everybody knows Ken Bimbo. Then yesterday, Ken Bimbo wrote to me, please don't talk too much and don't embarrass me in going at length about how a fine man I am. So I won't do that. Um, I will only say that, uh, well, yes, um, I have, I, I know Ken Bimbo many years ago, uh, and probably I know Ken Bimbo much less than many people around here. Anyway, Ken Binmore and Manfred J. Yoller were two people who tried over the years to get my, um, my career off the ground and they didn't succeed, but not because they didn't try, but because it was difficult. And, um, and I am, um, I, I mean, I, I have a, a, a great deal of gratitude with respect to Ken Binmore for, the, for how kind he was over the years to, uh, to support my career. And one of the reasons why I'm, uh, I am, um, uh, I, have, I feel gratitude for Ken Binmore is because he always has so many good ideas, new ideas. Every time when you read something that he writes, is something different. So when, uh, when I wrote Ken about the topic of this presentation, I expected him to talk something, to say something about uh, reciprocity or social norms or the evolution of social contract. And instead, he sent me a working paper, a brand new working paper on evaluating, evaluating stream of incomes and uh, intertemporal choice and inter, the, the interaction between intertemporal choice and uh, uncertainty, which is a new topic. Uh, and I just uh, read yesterday the working paper. It looks interesting. And I look forward for what Ken Bimor has to say about this topic, which is new, at least for me, is new. It's new meaning that I have never read something that can wrote on this topic over the, over the years. So I, I think everybody um, now wants to hear Ken saying something about this topic. So that's why I stop here and I leave the floor to Ken. Please, Ken. OK, thank you. Um, when, I, um, when I was invited by um, Manfred Hoyler to give this talk, I um, he asked me to uh, do something from my recent book, um, Crooked Thinking or Straight Talk, which I spend most of my time being rude to philosophers, but I do occasionally say things of interest. And one of the things I think of is interesting is chapter three, which is uh, Lorenzo was just saying is about intertemporal choice. Um, um, but while I was preparing this talk um, on chapter three of this book, I, I found its um, assumptions too metaphysical, and I, I, I felt urgently that I wanted to replace them by more psychological assumptions. And so I interrupted my preparation, um, trying to think this out anew. And I've had some success in that line. For which reason I uh, asked for a working paper to be circulated. But I have to apologize because this working paper is full of um, uh, unsupported assertions. And I'll draw out one particular case as I go along. But I'm going to start by talking about the um, talking about what's in my uh, chapter three of my book. Um, and uh, on your screen, you can see uh, a picture uh, showing a discounted sum. And what we want to do is to um, uh, value a, uh, a utility stream or income stream, U1, U2, U3, and so forth. And the standard way that this is done in economics is shown on the screen. Uh, you use a discount factor. If you didn't use a discount factor, the sum wouldn't converge, which people think is very important. 
And my attention uh, was drawn to the um, irrationality of this practice by um, being involved in a small way with the Stern Review. This is a colleague, economic colleague of ours, Nick Stern. Um, he wrote in 2007, I think, um, uh, The Economics of Climate Change, which was a, a big, big success in England. And his idea was to um, uh, take account of uh, very negative possible futures which had been neglected in previous studies because they had very small probability. And of course, if you've got a very small probability but a very large disutility, they might matter. So he wanted to correct the record. Uh, but the impact of his um, work was blunted because there then arose a dispute amongst um, uh, evolutionary economics, evolutionary, uh, evolutionary um, environmental ec economists, um, uh, environmental gurus about what is the correct social discount factor. And it struck me at the time this was a very strange thing to say because what would be a correct social discount factor? You know, how would you determine what the social correct discount factor would be? And it seems to me nonsensical to ask this question. It's kind of a metaphysical question that has no place in um, an analysis of um, what the environment holds for us in the future. In any case, what are we doing with the discount factor anyway in an intergenerational study? Don't we care about our children and our grandchildren at least as much as we care about ourselves? Why should we discount their welfare? Why aren't we treating all generations equally? And to which the standard answer would be, um, well, the sum wouldn't converge if we treated them all equally. To which the response is, well, why are we looking at an infinite sum? Aren't lives finite? Um, so that's what got me started on this. I'm in particularly interested in let's have a method which is the same for everybody. So we have equality, not just for those of us who are alive today, but equality for everybody. So let's first of all ask, well, what's the standard reasons that people give for discounting? And there are two standard reasons. I, I looked quite a lot in textbooks. I didn't find any others. And the first is um, to take account of risk. You know, when people look forward to the future, they usually worry a lot about risk because who knows what's going to happen tomorrow, what's going to happen the next day. And this delta is supposed to, this discount factor delta is supposed to take account of this risk in a primitive way. Uh, so the risk story is that delta is the probability that. Um, say delta three is the probability that the um, um, that U3, the third item in the utility stream, will be available um, in the third period, because it might not be. Um, and I think this is a really bad mistake to think like this, because it makes no sense, especially if you're using Bayesian decision theory, which is the normal thing. Because the fundamental principle of the uh, assumptions of Bayesian decision theory is that your preferences must be separated from your beliefs. All the axioms are about this, separating your preferences from your beliefs. And I think this is what we want, what we ought to be doing here also, not only in this context, but in all contexts where discounting takes place. So probably this is the most important thing I'm going to say. A philosophical thing, what we should be doing is separating our preferences from our beliefs. I'll get on to that on the next page. What about time on the clock? This is the other thing that's said, is that sometimes people actually care about what the clock says, where the hands are on the clock. And do really people really care about that, perhaps in some marginal way? You know, everybody would prefer to be young and vital than old and decrepit. Yeah, who can deny that? 
But what they really care about is not the time on the clock when they're young and vital. They care about being young and vital, and who cares what the time on the clock is? So I'm going to ignore time on the clock, which I think is a, a sort of frivolous distraction. Um, so separating preferences and beliefs. So how do we go about that? And the first thing I think we ought to do, as um, Nick Stern did, in, in essence, in his um, in his uh, evolution, in his uh, environmental study, we should set up what the problem is. And I've set up the problem here as a um, as a game. Um, you know, here's the root. In my example, here we begin with a chance move. Chance chooses to go this way. And then it's the player Adams, turn. he chooses to go this way. Here Eve is in an information set. She doesn't know whether she's here or whether she's there. But she chooses anyway, and then she chooses to go this way. And then Chance chooses to go that way. Eve chooses to go that way. And here's the end of the life where I've drawn an apple for people to eat. Um, so this is a life. This is a life. This is what I'm going to call a life. And you notice it's not infinite in length, it's finite. And not only is it finite, it's deterministic. All of the, um, and when we're considering this life, all the chance moves have made their choice. All the players have made their choice. We look back from the apple at the life, and we are looking at a deterministic finite sequence of um, utilities. Um, what we need to do is to consider all possible such lives, separating them completely from uncertainty, look at all possible lives, um, and ask ourselves, what are our preferences over these finite deterministic lives? And when we've done that, we'll be looking at a gamble. Um, which I've drawn here. So these are all the possible lives, finite and deterministic. These are the possible states of world. You know, the choices of the chance moves, the choices of other players, um, all contained in there. Um, this is called a gamble because by, by uh, Savage, because um, we don't necessarily have probabilities for these states of the world. If we have probabilities, objective probabilities for these states of world, we would call it a lottery. So a gamble, if you like, is a lottery where we don't know what the probabilities are that determine the lottery. Um, so this is the first step. Splitting the problem into two. First, we deal with our preferences over finite deterministic lives. Second, we look for the um, we look to assign probabilities to these states of the world, and then we seek to maximize our expected utility. Um, and you notice discounting appears nowhere. Here I've got a, a particular example. This is an example where Alice is going to be home all day, locked down by COVID, and um, so she. Um, She's going to adjust her controls in the morning. There's a chance move at the beginning, which is the weather deciding what the temperatures will be during the day. Alice knows something about this, but not much. And she sets her um, controls. Here she set her controls to go this way. After that, everything is deterministic. Here it's too cold. And uh, eventually the um, controls switch uh, the heating on and then we're in the Goldilocks state where it's not too hot and it's not too cold and we remain there for a while until it gets too hot and then the air conditioning comes on and so we switch to another state where it's still too hot for a while and eventually we switch back to the Goldilocks state. So here we've got um, four um, states which are relevant, I call them states of mind there's or three, I should say. There's too cold, there's Goldilocks, there's too hot, and here's Goldilocks again. So in this example, a life for me uh, will be too cold, Goldilocks, too hot, 
and Goldilocks again. And these are what I'm going to call subjective time periods or operational time periods, which will be dis to be distinguished from these objective periods, which I mark here as one hour at a time. Uh, so that's my next topic. Um, is to think about uh, what counts as a state of mind. Remember, I'm going to think of these too hot, too cold Goldilocks as operationally as states of mind. Now, here I'm very definitely uh, in my book, uh, Crooked Thinking or Straight Talk, because it was the metaphysics of what's coming next that I didn't like, and I thought I want to replace it by some psychology, something something remotely empirical, but I'm going to do the metaphysics. So in my chapter, I think of a, a, a human mind as a kind of finite automaton, and the uh, various states of the finite automaton correspond to uh, human states of mind. And I define these uh, states here to be uh, all-encompassing subjectively all-encompassing. I made a list of possible things that might go into the subjective information that's um, stored in a state of mind. And I've made the subjective into red because it's very important for everything I'm doing now that this information is subjective and not objective. Um, it might be, for example, that a person has uh, the image of a clock on their retina, um, but it needn't be the correct time. It needn't even be the time that's on an objective clock. Um, and the reason uh, for doing that here is that each of these states can be regarded, regarded as standalone uh, entities. And I want them to be standalone because, um, at least in my book, I want to be able to shuffle the states of mind in a life uh, so that their order doesn't matter. And in fact, since I've got mostly a German audience, <clears throat> I'm calling these states of mind here monads for that reason. Uh, I don't know how much philosophy everybody knows, but the philosopher Leibniz had this crazy theory of monads. Everything consists of monads, and the monads are standalone objects which somehow reflect the world. And these are what my states of mind are like, like Leibniz's monads. So here I've got uh, a life which consists of this state of mind, that state of mind, this state of mind, that state of mind, and so on. A finite risk. And um, in the chapter, I claim that because they're monads, uh, they're standalone, their order is irrelevant. We can treat them as though their order is irrelevant. So what I've done here is actually to switch the order of M65 and M17. Uh, and that switch doesn't make any difference. And the next step is to say, uh, well, not only does the order matter, all that matters about these states of mind, uh, for the purpose of the argument anyway, is that um, what their von Neumann Morgenstern utilities are. So we've got to begin with knowing what the von neumann morgenstern utilities are for all of these states of mind. And then our problem is, how do we evaluate an income stream like this, a utility stream? Not an infinite utility stream, a finite utility stream, and one in which you can shuffle the uh, payoffs back and forth. Um, but I'm not going to use objective time. That was why I was making a fuss about subjective time. And here, even in my chapter, I, I'm appealing to uh, discoveries of um, psychologists. And, um, you know, here is a, here is a, a, a life, I called it later on, a utility stream, finite utility stream. Here are the von Neumann Morgenstern utilities registered according to objective time. This is hour one, this is hour two, this is hour three, this is hour four. But look, this state of mind is the same as that state of mind. This state of mind is the same as that state of mind. Now, psychologists say 
that we don't register time like this. We don't register time in terms of a clock, what's on the clock. We register time in terms of incidents. What we pay attention to is um, how many incidents, what happened. Um, and uh, I'll give you an example. You know, when you're in a new city, uh, and most of us traveling around to give seminars or in new cities quite a lot, and you first of all have to find your way from your hotel to the location of the conference. And the first time you do that, it seems to take a long time because you find in your way from here, do I turn left, do I turn right? So there are many incidents that you pay attention to in passing from the hotel to the um, conference location. But the next day, it takes no time at all. And why does it take no time at all? Because you've got nothing to pay attention to anymore. You know the way. So there are no incidents. And look here, there's no incident between here and here because you're in the same state of mind. So this isn't an incident. And this isn't an incident. So we shouldn't count any of these guys separately. We should take the union of all these guys and call it a subjective time interval, which is what I've done here. So I guess to summarize what I'm just saying, subjective time intervals are elastic compared with objective time intervals. They depend on your psychology. They, de they depend on what incidents you're paying attention to or what are operational for you in the problem you're trying to solve. So this is how I'm modeling a state of the, um, uh, an income stream or a life, as I call it, um, subjectively. Now you have to give up quite a lot when you pass from objective time to subjective time because you're not allowed to say that something is second or something is third. You can say that one payoff comes after another. You can say that there's a first payoff and there's a last payoff. It's not meaningful to talk about a second payoff because if this was the second payoff here, or rather this was the third payoff here and this is the third payoff here. So second, third, fourth don't mean anything anymore. So we have to have a theory that doesn't depend on those place values. And here's my conclusion from my chapter. Um, and um, with, with appropriate assumptions, which I'm going to show you next, the conclusion is that um, when you evaluate such a stream, you can take into account only the minimum value, which is six, you know, six, six percent, six utils out of a hundred or 97%. Only the minimum and the maximum matter, um, which is completely different from discounting, of course. Only the minimum and the maximum matter. How they matter, um, well, one way they could matter is by using the Hurwitz criterion, uh, which is really very simple. I mean, Hurwitz would be ashamed that his name is attached to it. Uh, it's just a weighted average of the um, minimum and the maximum. Um, I mention it here because it's mentioned on the next page. Now in my chapter, I borrow all my arguments from John Milner. This is the famous John Milner, well it's probably not famous to this audience, but to people like me are the very famous John Milner, mathematician who wrote one wonderful, wonderful book, Differential Topology, the sort of book you can read in bed. Um, and uh, here is his summary of um, his results. This is 1954, I think. And what he's talking about is um, how to value gambles, not income streams, but gambles. And I'm applying his theory for gambles to income streams. But let's have a look at what he's saying about gambles first. Um, I don't know if you can read this. This is the principle of this is Laplace's principle of insufficient reason. What you do in a gamble is to give equal probabilities to all the states of the world, and then you maximize expected utility. 
This is the maximum criterion. You take the minimum of your um, prizes in the gamble, and then you take whichever gamble uh, has the largest minimum payoff. The Hurwitz criteria we just heard about, and minimax regret. Well, Milner's talking about that because two thirds of Savage's um, foundations of statistics is devoted to the minimax regret criterion, which he invented. Obviously, nobody ever reads the foundations of statistics anymore because um, uh, people say, you know, um, uh, Leonard Savage, the creator of Bayesian decision theory, which works always. But actually, um, Savage says it only works in small worlds. And he spends two thirds of his book uh, promoting the minimax regret criterion as something to be used instead of Bayesian decision theory in a large world. Um, I think it's no use actually because it fails the independence of the relevant alternatives, but that's beside the point. Uh, down here, we've got the various assumptions. Um, you probably can't read those all either, but I've got some. Um, whoops. Oh, shoot. I lost my. Oh, here we are again. And. Um, So you notice transitivity and um, um, <clears throat> although I talk about von Neumann Morgenstern utilities all the time, when I when I get to the psychology, all we actually need is transitivity for the basic result I've got. So um, you know, psychologists needn't be troubled by the fact that Conor and Morgenstern utility doesn't work very well in the laboratory. His symmetry is uh, in our setup order irre irrelevance. It doesn't matter in which order you take it. This is the um, assumption I didn't like uh, that I was just describing. Scalar relevance says that um, um, if you change the zero in the unit on your utility scale, you change the scale and unit on your valuation in the same way. That only really makes sense for von Neumann and more concerned utilities, so we don't want that either. This is independence of irrelevant alternatives. This is why I've crossed off minimax regret because it doesn't satisfy. This assumption is what um, uh, Milner calls um, column duplication. And uh, for me, it's subjective time. So subjective time does for me um, what column duplication does for um, Milner. Uh, it's not quite so good as column du duplication because you can't use it on the first term of a life or on the last term of a life, but you can use it on all the intermediary terms. And I don't think we need to worry about preference for mixtures. The circles represent um, properties that are true of the principles of, of heading the columns, and the stars represent characterizing properties. And um, you notice that um, uh, column duplication or subjective time is a characterizing property of the maximum criteria. It's also a characterizing property of the maximax criteria. Um, it's also a characterizing property of the Hurwitz criterion. So it's pretty clear where my max and min are coming from. Uh, and it's not very difficult, as I'm going to show you right now. Um, this is the proof. This is Milner's proof. Uh, and it's so simple, I'm going to explain it. Here is a life. This is the first payoff in the life, the second payoff in the life. This is the nth payoff in the life. And since we're assuming order doesn't matter, I can make the, um, uh, the first item here the minimum and the last item the maximum. And um, now I apply domination. Capital C is the maximum. 
and nobody's going to deny me um, domination. Okay, so weak domination. All of these guys are smaller than all of these guys. So this whole life is uh, worth less than this whole life. Or we can go the other way. All these guys are bigger, or at least as big as these guys. So this life must be at least as good as that life. And now, subjective time, all of these guys are the same. Because there's no, um, um, there's no incidence between them. There's no change of state of mind. So you know, for um, Milner, it's column duplication. For me, it's subjective time. This guy is the same as this guy. You notice how powerful column duplication of subjective time is. And this guy is the same as that guy. So this fellow, which is completely general, depends only on its minimum and on its maximum. It's the same at this end as at that end. Right? Um, so simple, that was why I could put it in my book. If I had anything more complicated, I wouldn't have been able to put it. Um, now, I, um, I want to talk a little bit about the implications. Um, I think it's very important, or at least for the way I'm talking about this, that we don't start in the abstract with a life in the way that um, Milner does with gambles. We um, extract the lives that we're going to look at from the model that we're going to study. And uh, what would happen here if we looked at this uh, example I used before about Alice controlling the heating in her house? Um, well, what we would see if we drew a graph, this is a graph drawn in objective time. Uh, you know, the, the numbers are arbitrary, I just made up any numbers. Here, perhaps these are 15 minute intervals. And, uh, you know, here's the maximum payoff. You know, perhaps these numbers are the average over 50, the average temperature over 15 minutes. Here's the maximum and here's the minimum. But suppose we went to an hourly um, um, assessment. Then we'd have to take the average temperature over an hour and then we get a different graph and we get a different maximum and a different minimum. So then the question is, what should we properly count as the maximum and the minimum? And um, it's not a problem uh, with what we've better called operational time here rather than subjective time. Um, because um, here are the subjective time periods. Here is um, too hot. Here is Goldilocks. Here is too hot. Here is Goldilocks, here is too cold, and so forth. So the switching points are fixed by when Alice's machinery switches on and off. And here are the intervals in between that she wants to value. So uh, assuming she's giving a, a higher utility to too hot, and, and the utility gets this high number, and too cold gets a, 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 a low number, this is the maximum and this is the minimum. Um, so this is one advantage. So there are two advantages that I want to emphasize. You know, one about this approach. One is the um, uh, splitting, separating preferences and beliefs. And to separate the preferences and beliefs, you need a model. You need a decision model that's going to tell you um, which lives to look at. And then uh, that same model helps you to structure um, your income stream because you don't have it. Given that you're going to use the minimum and the maximum, you don't have an ambiguity about what is the minimum, what is the maximum. So here I've, I've summarized what my book says, I, I basically I summarize what I just said. Yeah, here this gentleman is a lady or gentleman, who knows? I'm sorry, I don't want to be sexist. And um, so the first thing um, he or she does is to uh, write a model 
of the problem they want to solve. So if this person were uh, Nick Stern, he would have to write a model of the future history, possible future histories of the, of the world, which would be a big problem for him. And um, then two, uh, we look at lives within this model, um, finite deterministic lives within this model. Some of these nodes will be chance modes. But when you look at the life, you ignore. Um, you don't have to worry about what chance will do, what other players will do, because from the viewpoint of someone at the end of a life, which is the viewpoint you need to take, looking back, the life is deterministic and it's finite. Otherwise, you wouldn't be at the end of it. So, and here are two lives, a red life and a blue life. And uh, our uh, representative of uh, Nick Stern um, will have to compare all these red and blue lives. And it's important that he have transitive preferences. And it's better if he satisfies von Neumann Norbert Stern assumptions, but um, we can get by without if necessary. Um, and then he chooses his optimal strategy. Okay, so these three steps have to be separated for this to make sense. How am I doing on time? I'm not doing very well on time. Um, okay, fortunately, I'm the psychology, I can get through uh, pretty quickly. I don't want to go for more than an hour, it doesn't seem civilized. So um, this is the peak end rule. This is uh, a discovery of psychologists in the last um, 1993. So this was that when the first paper appeared. This is a paper of Kahneman and um, a, 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 for at least four other psychologists. And they did an experiment in which people were um, required to keep their hands in hot water, uh, uncomfortably hot water. And then um, uh, there, were, there were two um, versions of which, one of which took longer in objective time than the other. Um, I won't go into the details because anybody who's interested will want to read this paper. This is, I think, is a very important paper. And um, here is the summation that I've, I've written in black letters at the bottom. Duration plays a small role in retrospective, retrospective evaluations of aversive experiences. Such evaluations are often dominated by the discomfort at the worst and final moments of episodes. And uh, I, I haven't looked up the paper again, but I once heard Danny Kahneman lecturing on um, uh, what women remember about uh, the pain or discomfort of childbirth. And the peak end rule apparently applies there as well. What women remember is not um, very much. They don't remember it like a movie. This is actually what the paper says. We, people don't remember things like a movie. They remember things like snapshots. So the snapshot that they remember mostly obviously if your labor goes on for three days you remember this but if it's a, a more normal uh, labor experience you remember the worst pain and you remember how you felt at the end and presumably you feel very different if you're presented with a very healthy baby or uh, if some things go wrong you, you feel much less good about it um, so what does what I've got to say relate to the peak end rule? Um, so can we do without Milner is basically the question. And uh, I'm just going to describe uh, the results. Um, anyone who's seriously interested, uh, don't read the working paper that was circulated. Uh, uh, send to my email and ask me for my revised version. 
Um, um, so the value phi L of a life depends only on its first and last payoff and the maximum and minimum of the intermediate payoffs. This is the result I've got. And um, the assumptions are pretty strong, but they're not nearly so strong as the assumptions in my book. So I want to show you what they are. So the first assumption is subjective time. So I have explained this all. Um, and in fact, it's um, subjective time, the assumption of subjective time follows from the next axiom, which is much stronger than it looks, which is coarsening invariance. So um, I came to this by thinking over, you know, at the end of a day, uh, when you're asleep, your mind must edit your memories because you can't remember everything that happened during the day. You can't put that into your long-term memory. So somehow it must decide what to throw away and what to remember. Uh, and when it throws away a passage from your life, what's it going to put instead? It's going to put some summary of what it's thrown away. Um, and here there's co co coarsening invariance. So um, when you throw stuff away, I call that a coarsening. Um, uh, so if a new life is constructed from an old life, by replacing a sub-life by its value, the new life has the same value as the old life. So what this is saying is something very strong, is that when you edit your memories, your valuation is unchanged. Weak domination, well, that's hardly a, an assumption at all. And in my work in this, this vestigial, vestigial symmetry, Vestigial is an English word not often used, which saying there isn't very much of it. Okay. So I'm trying to get away with the idea there isn't very much in this assumption. So this is a life with only two outcomes, a, a little one and a big one. And it says, well, we've got a life with only a first, a first payoff and a last payoff. It doesn't matter in which order they appear. And I wish I could do without it, and I tried so hard to do without it, but I can't, as it turns out. Um, so how are we going to prove this result? Um, well, as I said earlier, when you've got a first element and a last element in the stream, well, they can't be dealt with in the same way as the intermediary elements. I haven't got time to explain why. But we can deal with the um, intermediary payoffs pretty much like we did in the previous discussion. And so um, for a fixed F and fixed L, I'm just going to write what we wrote before for a life. But you have to remember there's a first element and a last element as well, which have been suppressed. But they're going to be constant throughout this discussion. Now here I've repeated the analysis I've showed before. Uh, all of these guys are bigger or equal to all of these guys. Subjective time gives you this. All of these guys are um, all of these guys are less than or equal to all of these guys. Subjective time gives us this. So this is the same argument as before, which says that of the intermediary um, payoffs, only the smallest and the biggest matter. But we can't reorder these guys anymore. We're not allowed to do that. So if you look at the various cases, it depends whether the maximum comes before or after the minimum. And uh, in fact, four cases, uh, there's this case which corresponds to this. If the maximum was at the beginning and the minimum was the end, we get this case. If the maximum is in the middle, we get this case. If the minimum is in the middle, we get that case. And to make Milner's argument work, we need each of these guys to be indifferent to the others. These four have got to be equally valued. How am I going to get that? Well, I just assume that the vestigial symmetry. To make it work here, I need my coarsening 
invariants. So I use subjective time to repeat the C here, the capital C, and we've got one sublife here and the second sublife, capital C, C. I replace those by their values, which are the same, and that's the way I come. I'm sorry if I'm too quick, but um, it's not very difficult. And this is the conclusion. This is the conclusion. And uh, weak domination, coarsening invariance, and vestigial symmetry imply that the value of life depends on only four parameters the first payoff, the last payoff, the maximum intermediate payoff, and the minimum intermediate payoff. And you notice that. Uh, you know, a function that takes account of all these things doesn't have to take account of all of them. It can take account only of the last payoff and the minimum payoff, which is the peak um, end rule described in the paper of Kahneman's. Actually, there's quite a literature in the marketing uh, in marketing payoffs, right? but they don't emphasize the worst payoff, they emphasize the best payoff. So they're very keen on the fact that apparently um, sometimes people care about the best pair. But I haven't seen a good psychology paper on that. I have only seen marketing papers. Um, I've still got a little bit um, before my hour is up. So let me just tell you what happens if you do all of this which again, I don't like because it's really metaphysics. And instead of having a finite um, utility stream, you have a doubly infinite utility stream. Um, and if you assume von Norman Morgenstern utilities and you assume scale invariance, you get um, not the Hurwitz criteria, you get either maxi max either you can pay attention only to the max or you can pay attention only to the min and this seems so absurdly strong that uh, i've tucked it away at the end of my work but then i think i'd better stop and i'm sorry if i've gone on too long um, if there's any discussion i would love to hear it so lorenzo it's uh, back to you now.